It's time for a look into a game developed by a small indie studio in New Zealand, a studio called Black Salt Games. This video will look at the story from the popular Lovecraftian fishing horror game, Dredge. The gameplay was really fun, the fishing aspect had cool mini games with enough variation that it didn't ever seem repetitive. The nights and the anticipation of potential hallucinations and creepy events was actually pretty tense. The boat upgrade and progression system and inventory management was fantastic too. Please note that before we jump in, I need to mention that there will be spoilers in this video. With all that being said, let's get into it. Sometime in the early 1900s, a fisherman, responding to a job advertisement for an angler, is driving his boat and encounters thick fog, but he ends up colliding with some rocks not far from the very secluded small town of Greater Marrow. Accompanied by a smaller island opposite, called Little Marrow, the two islands make up what are simply known as the Marrows. Despite the lighthouse warning of surface hazards on the water, as well as a way for people to find their way home, there are a few places its light cannot reach, and this makes the water dangerous at night due to it being so dark. Anyway, the fisherman is greeted by the town mayor. The mayor greets him as their new fisherman, and states that due to his boat being wrecked, they can have one already there at the dock, it belonged to the previous fisherman, and then the mayor tells the fisherman to go fishing, but explicitly warns him to be back before sundown, before the fog rolls in. Arriving back, the mayor tells the fisherman that they can keep the boat, effectively buying it off of them, and they can pay off their debt to the town, a small amount taken direct from the proceeds of the sale of fish to the town's fishmonger. The fishmonger also states that from time to time he has special orders come in from customers too. The fisherman also meets the local shipwright who is able to make repairs and upgrades to the fisherman's boat. At some point in time, the fisherman meets the occupant of the lighthouse, an old lady. She looks at the fisherman with concern and apprehension. The lady tells him that there's nothing there for people like him anymore, and she tells him to move on. She then leaves. The mayor then asks the fisherman to deliver a package to Little Marrow. This package is dripping slightly and is damp. He delivers the item to the dock worker in Little Marrow, who seems very secretive about the package's contents. Then, after meeting a friendly trader who buys old, valuable trinkets, the fisherman returns to Greater Marrow. The mayor delivers good news and says that the town is growing, all thanks to the efforts of the fisherman, and due to this, the shipwright has been able to extend their services and open up a dry dock, meaning upgrades for the fisherman's ship. Going about his daily duties, the fisherman catches a strange looking fish. He takes it to the fishmonger, who is, safe to say, very intrigued by it. He pushes against the fish and a small shape can be seen against the scales. Slicing the fish open, he finds a small handkerchief inside. The handkerchief itself is patterned with a delicate crimson thread. Returning to his boat, the fisherman spots a man looking through the cabin window, his face obscured by shadow. He says that he knows what the fisherman took to the fishmonger and that he knows about the handkerchief that was pulled from it. The man tells the fisherman to meet him on Blackstone Isle, a small island to the south of the Marrows, which, according to the mayor, was sold to a private owner around 20 years prior, a private owner whom the mayor has actually never met. Asking about the previous fishermen, the mayor says that they were basically useless. He'd go out at night, catch no fish and sleep all day, but the one day the fisherman just left and never came back. Travelling to Blackstone Isle, the fisherman meets with the collector. Still acting very mysteriously, the collector seems to be holding a crimson book, and introduces himself as someone who is a collector of art, artefacts, treasures and truths. The fisherman gives the handkerchief to the collector and he studies it. He claims the handkerchief came from an old ship that he'd been searching for a ship that sank many years ago. Essentially, the collector needs help in retrieving more artifacts from this ship. Thing is, these artifacts are right at the bottom of the ocean, and the fisherman will need to dredge the depths. Thankfully, the collector has just the equipment for this task, and fits the equipment to the fisherman's boat. He gets to work. Speaking to the old lighthouse keeper again, she speaks about the mysterious fog, but upon being asked about the shipwrecks in the area, she mentions a spot around the back of Greater Marrow current carries in wreckage from the sea. Visiting the wreckage behind Greater Marrow, the fisherman dredges the wreck and finds one of the relics, a key whose teeth sway before your eyes like tendrils. He returns to the collector. The key has bizarrely changed shape. It's smaller. The collector mentions there should be a lock and gets agitated. It seems the artifacts have travelled to other places. He reads from the Crimson Book and bestows upon the fisherman an ability to travel at otherworldly speed on the water. Next stop, in search of the next relic, is Gale Cliffs. Gale Cliffs are a location in which the tall cliffs, which act as natural wind tunnels, create water spouts, creating a constant howling sound. It used to be a hideout for two pirate lords and was also a meeting place for pirates who bartered and sold what they had stolen. 
As a result of these meetings though, disputes would often arise and one conflict would take place, leading to the ships being destroyed and this is the reason for the many shipwrecks and treasures still left in the area. Nearby, a whaling town called Ingfell is located. Back in the day, this small town prospered when doing trade with the whaling ships, but then the whales simply just disappeared. Then, one day, pretty much everyone abandoned Gale Cliffs via boat, never to return. Something strange is going on in this area. The fisherman arrives and speaks to one of the few locals left at Ingfell. She speaks of an old whaler called Magron, who, because whales were so scarce, spent ages out at sea trying to find them, but found none. He did, however, find a scroll which told him that he could become immortal by eating mutated fish. Then, one day, Magran just disappeared. The fisherman encounters a massive fish lurking around the cliffs, but eventually they meet and speak to another man, who is inhabiting a small isle to the east of the main town of Ingfell. This man states that there's a wreck in the water by the houses of this little isle. He mentions the big fish that attacked the fisherman's boat and describes it as a hateful serpent, and mentions that it is consuming the cliffs at the core and is opening up chasms beneath the homes of the residents. He mentions that in order to clear the debris around the shipwreck, the fisherman will need some dynamite, and that he can get some from the man's brother, a whaler situated in the town. Long story short, the hermit fell out with his brother over a disagreement over how they should split their parents' inheritance, and the hermit stole the family's whalebone crest and then moved to the settlement on the small island. The brothers haven't seen one another for years. Problem is here that the creature in the waters dragged house debris into the burrows and the crest went down with it. The hermit needs this crest if he's to make amends with his brother. The fisherman manages to get the crest and delivers it back to the hermit. He then asks the fisherman to take it to his brother and to tell him that he's sorry. The brother accepts the apology and agrees to let his brother stay in his workshop. After blowing up some debris by the cliffs for the old man, the fisherman helps the hermit move back to the town. The old man gives the fisherman explosives and he uses them to clear the debris blocking the shipwreck by the settlement. He dredges the wreck and finds an old oaken music box which puts out a low rhythmic chime as it rocks with the waves. Taking it to the collector, he speaks more words from the book, bestowing upon the fisherman the ability to instantly travel back to Blackstone Isle as if by magic. Next up, the fisherman heads to the next location, Stella Basin. Stella Basin is a large atoll. It was once a popular tourist destination built on top of a coral reef, which attracted many people to it. Its warm and tropical climate made it a natural wonder too. Not just in certain seasons, but all year round. A stone fort to the north of Stella Basin was initially built in order to protect inhabitants from pirates to the east, and was later used during the war as a defensive position, as well as a lookout tower. Anyway, the fisherman arrives and docks at an old research outpost. A generator is hooked up to a strange contraption, but the outpost looks completely deserted. Its laboratory is wrecked, with equipment everywhere. The floor is damaged, leading the fisherman to assume that the damage was done by something very large and very powerful. Visiting the fort, the fisherman meets the researcher. She states that she was working from the research outpost, but that after the outpost was attacked by a tentacled monster, she was forced to flee. The creature now rests in the abyssal crater in the middle of the area. It's a crater, as it's the site of a meteor impact. After finding a bunch of specimens that the researcher needed, along with an old dog, left there presumably by the owner of the resort, the researcher gives the fisherman a device, able to retrieve samples from the abyssal zone. That's very, very deep. The abyssal zone is where the large tentacled creature lives, so in order to get it out of the way for long enough, the researcher also gives the fisherman some prototype parts for the generator on the research outpost. Fitting them and activating the device called their repulsion machine, sure enough the creature is gone long enough for the fisherman to catch more specimens for the researcher. Along with that, the fisherman manages to get the third relic from the abyss, a jewel encrusted band. After delivering all the specimens to the researcher, the fisherman heads back to Blackstone Isle and speaks to the collector. Upon opening his crimson book again, the collector speaks more words from it and gives the fisherman the ability to banish attacking creatures. The next destination is a place called Twisted Strand. This place, this mangrove, has a mind of its own and is home to strange creatures. It used to be a safe place for all natural life, but ships and boats that strayed too close to the thick fog ended up tangled in the branches and vines of Twisted Spine. Volcanic activity also exists in this area, with sea life adapting to this change almost unnaturally. The fisherman navigates the winding passageways and discovers a camp setup. A man is there. He's stranded and has clearly been living there for some time. The man describes the creatures living in the area as wretches. He explains that the boys called them mind suckers due to them being able to affect the mind. A pilot, the man explains that he and his squadron of fighter pilots were flying their planes over the twisted strand 
when they went down in the thick fog and they all took refuge under the giant tree. The man explains that his friends were picked off one by one. The fisherman agrees to help them avenge his lost squadron. He has a plan to kill the creatures with a mortar, but the man needs mortar parts from their lost planes in order to honour them and kill the creatures living in the Twisted Strand. The fisherman visits the two wreck sites and dredges out the barrel and the frame. The plan also requires bait to be placed in traps, and after catching the required fish for the bait traps, the fisherman and the airman get to work. One by one, the creatures get taken out. Returning to the airman with proof of the kills, he cuts one open and out falls a necklace, the fourth relic. A necklace with an emerald trapped by four cresting waves. The man, after careful consideration, decides to stay, seeing it as his home. Returning to the collector once again, he seems to recognise the necklace straight away. Speaking from his book, he grants the ability to harvest an entire shoal of fish. The fisherman now needs to head out to Devil's Spine, which is an active volcano amongst a city of ancient ruins. A volcano could erupt at any time, according to the mayor of Greater Marrow. Docking at what seems to be a small ritual island, the fisherman is greeted by a man. Described as a fanatic, the man claims the fisherman is a disciple, his arrival providence from the deep, that he has been calling, and the fisherman is the answer. What's more, he describes him as his replacement, and that his trial begins immediately. As a side note, back in Ingfell, a local described the man named Magran, the man who went mad after finding a scroll. Well, Magran disappeared from Ingfell, and the theory is that this fanatic is Magran. The locals in Ingfell nicknamed him Magran the Fishman, and look at his right arm, it has scales. The fanatic says that the fisherman's role as his initiate is to act as Herald of the Purge, and that he served in the same capacity too. The fisherman needs three stone hearths for the three idols on top of the ruins. The fisherman, whilst avoiding all manner of dangerous water-dwelling creatures, sacrifices various fish to the three shrines, manages to obtain all three fathomless flames, he then places them into the statues. The fanatic pulls out the fifth relic from inside his robe. It's an antique pocket watch. Beginning to chant with the pocket watch in his hand, the fanatic simply fades away. The fisherman takes the leftover pocket watch and returns to the marrows. Going to Blackstone Isle and talking with the collector, the fisherman demands to know more about the book. The collector tells the fisherman that he should remember, as he was there when it was found, as was she. He tells the fisherman that he wanted to forget, and that he begged the collector. The fisherman asks for the book. The collector doesn't hand it over, so the fisherman turns to violence. The collector is merely just the fisherman's own reflection. What on earth is going on here? Before we tackle the endings, let's discuss what happened. Alright, well look at what happened in the lead up to the start of the game. The fisherman we control throughout the game is a former resident of Greater Marrow. He is the former fisherman that the town mayor was referring to as being lazy and unremarkable. It's very clear that the only person who remembered and recognised the fisherman was the old lighthouse keeper. As well as conversations giving us some backstory, we can also glean some understanding of the backstory through the various message bottles floating in the water. It turns out that in 1926, the fisherman was courting a woman named Julie, buying her a necklace engraved with her initial J. Eventually, in March 1927, the fisherman would propose to Julie at the Stella Basin, and the pair would later get married in August of that same year. On their honeymoon, they were sailing around the inlets at the back of Greater Marrow. The previous day, the fisherman had carried out a renaming ceremony for his boat, renaming it from Ocean's Riches to Julie after his wife. He carried out a ceremony, super cautious that he'd done it right, because he didn't want ill fortune to follow his boat. He threw out everything relating to the ocean's riches, a practice which is crucial in this process. But Julie messed up. She had kept a key ring with the boat's old name on it. Very bad luck. And lo and behold, the following day they had a slight accident after hitting a rock and some items fell overboard. Of course, the fisherman was paranoid about whether or not he performed the renaming ceremony properly. One of these items was likely the oaken music box, which was later recovered from a shipwreck and bought by a Michael Schult, whose ship got wrecked at Gale Cliffs. Around three weeks later, since the accident, he refused to take Julie aboard with him when he was working. He puts it down to not wanting her to be bored, but really it was likely down to his superstition around the renaming ceremony. Julie notes that the fisherman had some salvaging equipment installed onto the boat. She was desperate to have a go and try and find some treasure. Five days later, Judy writes about being afflicted with some sort of strange chill, which has clouded her brain. Accompanying her husband on the boat while salvaging, after pulling up loads of junk, they eventually came upon a large wooden casket. Upon opening the casket, crimson cloth spilled out onto the deck of the boat. The fisherman then looked at his wife, and she writes that in his eyes, she saw the void. At this point, Julie had died. 
due to what they had found, they'd unleashed something from the depths. When the fishermen entered into Greater Marrow at the start of the game, they encountered a thick fog. At the point that they'd unleashed this something from the depths, a great fog filled the entire area. In the Marrows, Greater and Little Marrow, a sense of unease hit the town and the surrounding waters became unsafe. This extended to Gale Cliffs, where after strange things started happening in the Marrow, most of, if not all of the whales in the area disappeared. Trade in Ingfell basically just stopped, and people started leaving via boats never to return. Again, changes that spread from the Marrows caused the hotspot of Stella Basin to decline as well. Mysterious and hazardous creatures started to appear, such as dangerous jellyfish, and a rumbling sound started coming from the deep. The owner and the staff eventually abandoned the resort. The researcher discovered with the help of the fishermen that the creature inhabiting the basin was actually harming the other ocean life forms at a cellular level. During the game, the rot is mentioned, and this entity at the bottom of the stellar basin was essentially given form by the rot, which explains why the creatures in the waters are being harmed by it, hence the aberrations and the weird fish you can find. Also, the researcher mentioned her deceased sister and how she kept finding letters written after her sister had died. We see this as well through the bottled messages. One note in particular was written by a fisherman. This was, I suspect, one of the fishermen present when they bought at the old casket. See all the waters claim souls, so to speak. But it turns out that the something that they'd unleashed was Leviathan, keeper or protector of the seas. This game being eldritch horror is steeped in the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. Leviathan is a sea serpent noted throughout both theology and mythology. It's mentioned pretty often in the Bible, and according to some circles of Lovecraftian lore though, Leviathan is regarded as an offspring or an avatar of Cthulhu. Cthulhu himself is a cosmic entity, an alien who'd randomly landed on Earth at some point. He's depicted as an octopoid who lives in a slumber, as though he's dead. He lies entombed in the sunken city of Relia. This sunken city itself could be Relia, or at least a reference to it. When entering into a mysterious cave in the ancient ruins, we can find paintings on the walls. On the left wall, a depiction of the birth of civilization, a beacon of light repelling a tentacled figure emerging from the sea. On the right wall, the fall of a civilization. Volcanic eruption tears through a tall lighthouse, and their monstrous shapes devour people as buildings turn to ruin. Worshippers of Cthulhu would speak a phrase, which translated roughly as, in his house at Relia, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. But why am I talking about Cthulhu? Well, we'll get to that shortly. The next person we need to look at is the old town mayor. The collector stated at one point that the mayor went with the fishermen on trips, but was apparently more of a hindrance than anything else. Well, the old mayor was present on the boat when they had recovered the casket from the depths. Not only that, but we also meet him at one point. After a chat with the old mayor, we see that although he seems to have almost lost his mind, he still remembers the fisherman. Through conversation, we gather that after they'd salvaged the casket, the thing that they'd brought up from the depths, cloaked in fog, came up through the boat. It spoke and told them it wanted their breath as they wouldn't be needing it anymore. Everyone then got thrown overboard. Eventually, the crew all got washed up and the fisherman was still clutching the crimson book. Crimson as it was covered in the fisherman's wife's blood. The crew, along with the old mayor, urged and pleaded with the fisherman to throw the book back into the sea, but he stubbornly refused to do so. This is why the old mayor acts like he knows the fisherman and asks him if he threw the book back. Now, on to why the fisherman remembered absolutely none of this. The fisherman, after all this had happened, left Grey Tomorrow and went to live on Blackstone Isle. He studied the Crimson Book extensively. When he got corrupted by the Crimson Book, through obsessively studying it, this caused a split in his personality. On the one hand, there was a fisherman who would remember absolutely nothing, and who would return to Grey Tomorrow years later, of course, with the book in his possession, right from the start of the game, as you can see here. And on the other hand, the collector who remembered absolutely everything, and was determined to complete a ritual which would bring his wife back to him. The collector was essentially dormant, up until the point that the fisherman would see him looking through the window of his boat. It was essentially just a reflection of himself. But the man's wife being resurrected isn't the only thing that would happen upon such a ritual taking place. Let's discuss the endings. So I guess we should start with and look at the bad ending first. In the bad ending, the fisherman goes to the collector and gives him the fifth relic. They then go out on the boat and perform the ritual. The fisherman's wife has been resurrected, but at what cost? 
Remember we disgusted Cthulhu? Well, Cthulhu as a result of the ritual has awoken from his slumber and essentially destroys the entire world. In the good ending, however, the fisherman meets with the old mayor on his island and then speaks with the lighthouse keeper who herself witnessed everything happen on that fateful night in 1927. The fisherman is convinced that he just needs to throw the book back and move on, to be done with it. So he sails out to where the incident first happened and threw the book into the water. The Leviathan, who has been following the fisherman around the entire time, will devour the fisherman, his boat, the book, and therefore he is killed, but is reunited with his wife, the fog is lifted, and the world is effectively saved. Finally, this ending makes it clear that Leviathan was possibly attempting to prevent a disaster and was trying to protect the seas and prevent the awakening of Cthulhu. This is also seen through the Leviathan's attempt to stop the fishermen from sailing away and out of the area, as well as the fact that Leviathan seems to be following the fishermen. This is also backed up by a side quest where a small boat belonging to a courier is anchored in the shallows due to being pursued by the Leviathan. This is due to the courier being tasked with delivering an oozing package to the dock worker in Little Marrow, who, when visiting him later on, had gone mad and had turned into some kind of zombie-like state. I guess the Leviathan was trying to prevent things from spreading. But that's it for this video. If you did enjoy this one, then please leave a like and comment your thoughts down below. Being a Lovecraftian and Eldritch style horror game means that this game is so deep with mythology and lore that I could probably spend another two weeks on this video and still not look deep enough into what it all means. But anyway, for now, take care and I'll see you in the next one.